I'm Emily Chang and this is the best of Bloomberg Technology where we bring you all our top interviews from the week in tech. Coming up, global leaders gathered in New York for the inaugural Bloomberg Global Business Forum. We'll bring you the highlights including conversations with Jack Ma, Masayoshi Son and Tim Cook. Plus, Nest has made a name for itself in the smart home world. Now it's going beyond thermostats and webcams with a whole new home security system. We'll hear from CEO Marwan Fawaz in an exclusive interview. And why Hulu's big Emmy wins for The Handmaid's Tale are a major breakthrough for streaming services. But first to our lead, highlights from the Bloomberg Global Business Forum, a gathering of more than 50 heads of state and hundreds of global CEOs addressing economic growth and prosperity. Let's begin with my conversation with Alibaba CEO Jack Ma. The company has seen massive growth this year, its stock easily outpacing another tech giant, Amazon, thanks to dominating sales in China and its expansion overseas and beyond e-commerce. Here's what Ma had to say about the comparison between Alibaba and Amazon. Amazon is an e-commerce company and very successful and we respect a lot. But Alibaba is not an e-commerce company. We are e-commerce enabler. We are e-commerce infrastructure builder. So as I said, people may like, like it. I say our job is to enable more companies become Amazon. So uh, when we see Amazon is doing good job, is successful, we're telling everybody, you know, e-commerce works. So we don't, we're not necessarily competing, but investors and uh, the journalists always put like competitor because I spent very, very little time studying the, you know, how can we compete with Amazon? Is how we can learn from Amazon that uh, empower more business can be more efficient on internet time. They uh, recently bought Whole Foods. You have been investing in, in groceries for a long time. Yep. I'm curious where you see similarities and differences in your strategies. Yeah, we, uh, we said uh, in China, we, in the past 15 years, we grow so fast on retail. A lot of people say, well, we destroy retail, traditional retail. So the question we started to think about five years ago, destroying retail is not our purpose. Our mission is helping doing business easier. So we cannot helping the, uh, the new retailer destroy the old retailer. So we say, how can we using our technology, our data, our market power to help in the traditional uh, uh, retailer? So it's not by destroying them, we want to enable them. So that's why we, we invest and buy a lot of uh, 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 traditional supermarkets, uh, malls. We want to learn and then we want to help more. This is the opportunity. Alibaba is trying for a third time to get approval for the MoneyGram acquisition, U.S. money transfer company. What's plan B if that doesn't happen? Well, I cannot actually, honestly, I, I, uh, I leave this job for the Ali Enter Financial, Ali Payne to do that. And, and today uh, I cannot make comments because I know so little they are yeah. applying for the third times. So I, I cannot make a comments about that. Um, I trust the world is going to be more open-minded and the globalization should not stop it, and uh, protectionism will stop. But today, for this period, it takes time for Chinese company and uh, the, the American government or government to communicate and some features it will be helpful. You've said that Alibaba will create a million jobs in the U.S. by 2021. Tell us more. How many jobs so far? What kind of jobs? Well, we think in five years, we signed, uh, we started to agree last year. So in five years, we create one million jobs. We want enabling more small business in America, helping them to sell products to China, helping them sell products to Asia, which we are pretty good at that. And we think in China, we created 33 million jobs. So each business, if they're online, they can create at least three jobs. So we hope that we can help one million small business in, in, in America. They can list on Alibaba site and we help them to sell to Asia and to China. We had a successful Detroit uh, conferences. We start testing and I think we'll probably gear up next year. Last question, you've said Alibaba has a three, five and 10 year plan. What are those plans now? Well, we're working on that and we have uh, not only three, five, ten, three years is uh, the, the plan. 
and five years is the direction, uh, is the, the, the strategy direction, and 10 years the vision, 20 years. Yeah. So we always have to think about the future because we, as the, since nine, 1999 when I started the business, I said doing business on the internet, e-commerce, is like a 10,000 meters marathon right. running. So you should have uh, run as fast as a rabbit, but you should have as, as patient as a turtle. You have to be very, very patient. You have to think big, think the future, and then you can, you can be happy. Otherwise, you have so many problems. Until 2101, 102 years is your, your plan, right? Yeah. 2101. 102, Why 2101? Yeah, well, Where'd no, you get one that or two number? Years. <laughs> well, we were born in 1999. Last this century, we had a one year, and this century, won 100 years, and plus one year, 102 years will, will cross three centuries. So every number you're giving to the team should be accurate. So the more accurate you are, the more serious you are, and your employees, your colleagues, your friends will take it seriously. My conversation there with Alibaba founder Jack Ma. And there was a powerhouse panel at the Global Business Forum. Carlyle Group co-founder David Rubenstein sat down with Dangote Industries CEO Aliko Dangote, Microsoft founder Bill Gates, PepsiCo CEO Indra Nooyi, and SoftBank's Masayoshi Son. The topic? What else but innovation? Last 30 years, the innovation of the microprocessors, using microprocessor as a base to create internet, that is the has changed the life of almost everybody on the earth. But going forward, it's, I think it's accelerating even, even more on that. Now, Mas, earlier in your career, you were a technology in, uh, innovator. And at one point, I think in year 2000, you lost $70 billion of net worth. What did it feel like to lose $70 billion <laughs> of net worth in one year? <laughs> well, uh, it, it was a crash. Everybody crashed, <laughs> but uh, somehow, you know, I, I, at the bottom of the crash, I actually revived my spirits of the fighting, you know, so actually it was good. Yes. By the way, <laughs> by the way, by the way, maybe Bill does not know, for three days I became richer than Bill in that day. <laughs> Well, but then after 12 months later, I, I became almost broke because 99% 99 drop in our share price, 99% in one year. So well, let me ask you one other question about your career for a moment. Uh, at one point, you made an investment of $20 million in a little company that wasn't heard of by many people called, I think it was Alibaba. Yes. Um, it became worth about $90 billion and now worth about $130 billion. So uh, how did you decide that Alibaba was a good investment? And do you have any more like that you could recommend to us? <laughs> well, uh, the Jack Ma, not because of the business model, not because of the technology, it's because of his charisma in leadership. And uh, China had enormous opportunity uh, of the upside. Uh, I said, this is the guy that can be the leader for this innovation. Okay. Uh, Indra, you've tried to take a company that was known for selling, selling sugar water in some, the view of some people and make it a more nutritionally um, safe and better company. Was that hard to beat the bureaucracy back at Pepsi when many people didn't want to do the things you wanted to do? I think it was hard within the company. It was hard outside the company. I remember um, even investors telling me that, you know, don't forget we are Americans. We like our soda and chips. Don't try to change us. And when I asked them if they changed their habits, he said, oh yeah, we've changed our habits, but we don't want you to change what you're doing. So we had to fight <coughs> battles across multiple fronts. Change does not happen quickly in our industries because we have to change consumer taste, we have to change the product portfolio, we have to change the business system. So it's still happening, it's a work in process. Now if you go to somebody's house for dinner and they say, would you like Coke, what do you say? Or do you, does that ever happen, or you leave the dinner, or you? Yeah, sure. I say it was nice knowing you, uh -huh. <laughs> and I leave. Uh -huh. So, Bill, I'd like to ask you. I do leave. Yeah, <laughs> without a doubt. <laughs> Actually, my secretary sends them a list ahead of time in case there's a mistake. <laughs> Bill, I'd like to ask you a question. I have asked you before, but uh, people are interested in this answer. Uh, all of us who have used personal computers are used to turning them on, and we have to have three fingers to do so. Control, Alt, Delete. And it's a little awkward sometimes to do that, 
Uh, you were the person who came up with the idea of doing it that way. Why did you do that? <laughs> The IBM, the IBM PC hardware keyboard uh, only had one way that it could uh, get a guaranteed interrupt generated. So, uh, you know, clearly the people involved, they should have put another key on uh, in order to make that work. A lot of machines nowadays do have that as a, you know, more obvious uh, function. Uh, but no regrets about doing it that way? It worked out okay? Well. I'm not sure you can go back and change small things in your life without putting the other things at risk. Uh, sure, if I can make one small edit, I would, uh, I'd make that a single key operation. Now, now uh, by the way, you dropped out of college. Um, do you think had you gotten your college degree, your life would have been better off? <laughs> well, at the time, it, it felt like uh, there was a huge sense of urgency that Obviously, the microprocessor was revolutionary in writing software for it. A lot of existing companies, including IBM, with infinite resources would go and do that. So if we were to have any hope, you know, the sooner we did it, the quicker we did it, the more hardcore we were about it. Uh, and so I didn't want to waste a day. And in my 20s, you know, I worked weekends. I, I didn't believe in vacation. Uh, we had to move at high speed because eventually, IBM did come in and do OS2 and compete with us, and uh, you know, lots of companies came along later. Of the companies that were formed in that period, we were really the sole survivor. Oracle did another type of software. They're about our vintage uh, as a software company, but those are the only two companies that really uh, survived out of that era. Us, because we were a broad product company, we did platforms, we were very, International, so I wouldn't. It would have been hard to hold me back once I saw that opportunity. Uh, Harvard, which I loved, was a very relaxed thing where you would sort of sit in classes and stay up all night and talk to people. It didn't have that if I same intensity. So I, I really, once I saw the opportunity, uh, I was going to leave. And as, your your parents, what did they say? Uh, they were saying, "Hey, we were paying your tuition." Uh, <laughs> what does this mean? And I said, well, I'm on leave, uh, which is true. I could have gone back. Uh, Harvard's very generous about that. I mean, eventually, the course catalog sort of changes on you, and you're a little too old for it. But uh, they, they, they weren't sure if it would succeed or not, so they, they thought maybe I'd head back. But you know, because I was single and mo just maniacal, uh, in those days. It was a perfect thing for me. That was Carlisle Group co-founder David Rubenstein with Dangote Industries, Aliko Dangote, Microsoft founder Bill Gates, PepsiCo's Indra Nooyi, and SoftBank's Masayoshi Son. Well, Google has agreed to buy part of HTC's engineering and design teams in a deal valued at $1.1 billion. The deal helps boost its growing hardware business by owning a manufacturer outright, Google gains tighter control over production of its Pixel smartphone and other devices. Coming up, more coverage from Bloomberg's Global Business Forum. Apple CEO Tim Cook explains why he stepped up his rhetoric on U.S. immigration policy. This is Bloomberg. Former Cisco CEO John Chambers is stepping down from the board after 24 years. Chuck Robbins, who's been CEO since 2015, will take on the role of executive chairman. The change gives Robbins more complete control to steer, to steer Cisco away from its reliance on high-priced hardware, which provides most of its revenue. Let's return now to Bloomberg's Global Business Forum. Apple CEO Tim Cook, outspoken on his views about immigration, told Bloomberg's Megan Murphy why he believes it is the biggest issue of our time. We're pushing extremely hard on this. This is, uh, I think it's the biggest issue of our time currently, among all these big issues, because this goes to the values of being American. This is, are we human? 
uh, uh, are we acting with, uh, in a uh, track of morality, right? These people, if, if, if you haven't met them, uh, the, at, at Apple we have many that came to the U.S. when they were two years old. They didn't exactly make a decision to come. Uh, they came here, they only know our country. This is their home. They love America deeply. When you talk to them, I wish everyone in America loved America this much. They have jobs, they pay taxes, they're pillars of their communities. Uh, they're incredible people. And so, to me, it would be like someone coming to Mike and saying, oh, Mike, I just found out you aren't really a citizen here, you need to leave. This is unacceptable. This is not who we are as a country. And so, I, I, I am personally shocked that there's even a discussion of this. This, this is one of those things where it is so clear, and it's not a political thing, or at least I don't see it like that at all. This is about basic human dignity and respect. It's just, it is that simple and straightforward. On the broader sub subject of immigration, uh, if I were a country leader right now, my goal would be to monopolize the world's talent. <laughs> I'd want every every smart person coming to my country yep. because smart people create jobs and and jobs is the ultimate um ultimate things that create a great environment in a country a land of opportunity a land where everybody can do well if you work hard uh, these are the things that drive people it gives people a sense of purpose and uh so i i'd, I'd have a very aggressive plan, not, not just to let a few people in. I would be recruiting. Right. And, and, and so I, I think I, was in, I went to Ellis Island on, on Sunday yeah. because I wanted to feel myself what it was like to come to the country. And if you've ever sat in the Great Hall and one of the benches that were there in the early 1900s, you can feel the people in that room. And you can kind of feel both the anxiety and the hope. And I think that, that is where we all started from. Maybe not Ellis Island, maybe it was Virginia like my family. But we all started somewhere. We are all descendants of immigrants in the United States. That was Apple CEO Tim Cook speaking with Michael Bloomberg, the founder and majority owner of Bloomberg LP, the parent of Bloomberg News, and Megan Murphy at the Global Business Forum. Coming up, she is the most powerful regulator in Europe, slapping fines against Apple, Facebook, and a record penalty on Google. We'll hear from European Commissioner for Competition, Margaret Vestager. And later this hour, the biggest cities in America are bidding to be the next location for Amazon's second headquarters. So which locales are the top of the tech giants list? This is Bloomberg. Uber is suing advertising agency Fetch Media for click fraud, alleging that the firm improperly billed the company for fake online ads and took credit for app downloads that it had nothing to do with. Fetch is owned by Japan's Dentsu, the world's fourth largest advertising company. As part of the lawsuit, Uber plans to seek at least $40 million in damages, according to people familiar with the matter. Well, after a record $2.9 billion fine from the EU, Google is figuring out how to comply with an order to stop promoting its own shopping search results over competitors. While the clock ticks down to Google's deadline, Bloomberg's David Gura sat down with European Commissioner for Competition, Margaret Vestager, in Washington and discussed the case. We have found that Google is dominant in the European market of general search and that Google has been misusing this very strong and dominant position uh, to promote itself uh, in, with the Google Shopping product and to demote uh, competitors. Uh, on average, you would find competitors on page four mm. in your search result, and viewers can ask themselves, well, how often do I go there? While you are always finding Google Shopping uh, top uh, left corner uh, in, in the best placement. And the decision says that uh, you have to apply a principle of equal treatment between Google Shopping 
and uh, competitors because you're dominant. Uh, and now it's up to Google to figure out, well, how to do this, uh, because this is the only way to make a, a, a remedy uh, future-proof, uh, because this page design will change, screen sizes will change, everything will change. Uh, but we still need this to be adhered to. So, of course, we, it remains to be seen how Google will live up to this. Uh, Bloomberg is reporting today that uh, Google is proposing sort of an auction system. They would sell space to rival mm -hmm. Uh, companies, and that's something they proposed in, in 2013 uh, it, with another issue. Can you confirm that that's the case? Have they floated that as an idea? Yes, we got uh, we got a first draft of what they were thinking, uh, I think about uh, two weeks ago. So we got a broad outline about what they're thinking. But the thing is that it's not for us to approve. It is for Google to find a way to live up to the decision. Uh, and this is, of course, very important, uh, because if Google uh, does not live up to the decision, then we will start investigating, uh, well, what is the situation and is competition still harmed so that consumers have less a choice that they would otherwise have. So if, if come the 29th of September or however many days uh, mm -hmm. after you're not satisfied, uh, when does fining start? When do you begin to calculate and assess fines against Google if they haven't met the, the burden that you'd like them to meet? Well, actually, we can sort of backdate uh, the fine so that it will start from the first day that we find that there's been a, a non-compliance uh, with the decision. Um, so obviously, if, if we find, for instance, mark uh, market uh, well, competi competitors uh, complain, the consumers may complain to say, well, this is, this is not what it was supposed to be. Uh, if we find reason, uh, we will start investigating and then we can predate uh, the fines uh, if we find that there is a breach of, uh, of following up on the decision. Can you give us any sense of the timetable here with these two other Google cases? There's the AdSense case and the Android case. Mm -hmm. Uh, as well. Uh, how close are you to resolution of those two? Well, they are, they are very different, uh, the two cases, uh, because the AdSense case concerns uh, placement of ads on, on third-party uh, sites and, and whether or not that market was foreclosed. Uh, the Android case is how Android is used uh, to stay dominant also when we all go mobile. So that the sort of the experience from the box when you open the box of, of your new phone is a Google experience. Uh, we treat both cases as, as high priority cases, but it's very difficult to say when we will be, be uh, able to take a final decision. Can you say which is farther along than the other, or are they both kind of proceeding uh, in tandem? Well, as I said, they're different, so mm. we have, uh, have two case teams, and uh, I don't know if they're competing as, as well, but, uh, but we really put a lot of effort into this because it is important for uh, all market participants to know what will be the final decision. A couple of months ago, I was speaking with Dara Kush Rashahi, who was then the head of Expedia. Mm -hmm. uh, he's now, of course, uh, at Uber, and, and he was is expressing concern about Google with regard to travel services. When you look at the mammoth apparatus that is Google, are there other parts of the business that uh, concern you or that might lead to, to investigations? Well, we have quite a lot of, uh, of complaints on, on other uh, verticals. And the thing is that with the Google shopping decision, uh, having established that Google is dominant in, in general search. And when a company is dominant, well, obviously, uh, competition is already weakened a little uh, if you hold 90% of, of the market. And this is where this special responsibility comes from, that you shouldn't misuse your powers in your own market or neighboring markets. So uh, this gives us a, another starting point looking at uh, travel or, or locals, uh, so in, in that respect, yes, uh, we still take a, a strong interest in Google behavior in, in these other markets. Coming up, after going for almost a year without introducing a new device, Nest is rolling out a slew of new products. We will take a look at the items, plus speak with the company's CEO about what is ahead. And a reminder, all episodes of Bloomberg Technology are live streaming on Twitter. Check us out at Bloomberg Tech TV, weekdays 5 p.m. in New York, 2 p.m. in San Francisco. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to the Best of Bloomberg Technology. I'm Emily Chang. Nest is known for its cameras that can be set up in the home and watched from anywhere. Now it's rolling out new devices from doorbell cameras and a home security system with a slew of bells and whistles. Bloomberg Tech's Mark Gurman got his hands on some of the new devices. Check them out. This is product launch number three for 2017 for Alphabet's Nest. After introducing a cheaper thermostat as well as a 4K indoor security camera, now Nest is taking on the whole home security ecosystem in a big way with four new products. 
The first is a doorbell called Nest Hello. The device uses your existing doorbell system, but it adds a camera so you can record who's at your front door. It's also come out with a digital door lock in collaboration with Yale. It may not have much unique functionality, but it looks like a Nest product with its sleek design and connectivity with other Nest devices. Number three, a new outdoor security camera that can withstand weather and stream video to your phone. But the most significant new device launched is the Nest Secure. It comes with three main pieces, a main hub with a speaker and a pin pad, window and door sensors, and key fobs. What sets it apart is that it's a complete do-it-yourself kit. You can install the $500 device without needing expert help. And if you want to fork out more, you can have it monitored for a monthly fee. On the software side, Nest is turning some of its cameras into mini Google Homes by adding Google Assistant support via a software update. Now, none of Nest's new products necessarily move the bar forward for the industry. These are all concepts that have not only been tried before, but executed successfully. But still, it's critical for the Alphabet unit to continue releasing products so that its customers will remain in their ecosystem and so that Nest can keep selling them subscriptions on a monthly basis. Mark Gurman, Bloomberg News, San Francisco. Now on the news of the product releases, I caught up with Nest CEO Marwan Fawaz for an exclusive interview and discussed how he plans to grow the company. It's not just about the product, it's about the whole ecosystem. Mm -hmm. So the ecosystem around, the software behind it, um, the integrations with other devices in the home, for example, our cameras. Uh, so we, every product we build um, work very closely with any other products we build in the past. So we wanted to make sure that they talk to each other. We wanted to make sure that they're seamlessly, um, the seamless experience, uh, as well as the installation um, and the maintenance of the products are the right experience for our customers. So that takes a while. You took over for, for Tony Fidel, and I'm curious, how are you similar and how are you different to Tony? So we have different backgrounds. I mean, my background is mostly as a service provider background. So I focus a lot on customer uh, support, uh, service, uh, um, areas that uh, around, you know, being stand behind our products. Um, so that's a, I bring a lot of that background into Nest. So I, you would say that's one big difference. Um, the companies still have the same DNA when Matt and Tony started it. Let's talk about that because you know there were reports of cultural issues, infighting. There were there were recalls, and I'm curious how you've moved beyond that and what the stamp is that you want to put on the company. Well, we we want to be a global company. Mm -hmm. uh, we want to continue growing our portfolio of products. We're so excited. I mean, yeah. Yesterday, we've doubled our portfolio of products. That's a big milestone for us. So that's one step of many, many steps we're taking. How about, you know, the culture within the company itself? I mean, do you feel like things have changed, things have grown? Um, just give, I mean, given, you know, some of the reports about some of the difficulties in making this big transition that you I, were I'll tell about. you what I, what, I, what I tell everybody that asks me this, including my friends. Mm -hmm. This is the most talented team I've worked with in my career. Um, great talent, great team. I inherited a very strong team and lucky to have that. Um, just building on that. Um, each, each leader has a different style. My style is different, but, uh, but the core business and the core message for our company has not changed. What's your mandate from Larry Page? Um, be a, grow the business and be a meaningful business. Can you talk a little bit about the relationship between Nest and Google? We collaborate very closely. Uh, we collaborate very closely in our products. Um, we, uh, we work closely on integrating the different experiences. Yesterday we announced that uh, Google Assistant now is part of uh, one of our cameras. So that's, uh, you know, that's a milestone for, for one of the collaborations. But we work across uh, different areas within Google. Um, you know, we, we leverage a lot of the you know, great technology, especially around machine learning and AI, and we pack our products with a lot of these you know, intelligence, uh, but that's, you know, that's the beauty of being part of uh, Alphabet, is we, we, we have the independence to grow our business while we leverage different technologies across Alphabet. So Google just took a big stake in HTC. Curious what that means for Nest and, and you know, what you know about the strategy there. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's, uh, it, 
it's a great uh, opportunity for uh, for the hardware team. Uh, I mean, Rick knows that business extremely well from his back from his background on Motorola. Um, you know, the Pixel product is doing is doing very well. I, I think it's just a natural extension for that business for them. You mentioned Google Home. This is obviously huge competitive territory. Uh, you know, Google, Amazon has uh, the Echo. Apple has HomePod. When it comes to the connected home, how do you see the competition shaping up? It's in the early stage mm. for all of us. All of these companies you mentioned. Um, you know, there are a lot of opportunities still left to, to change the experiences in the home for consumers. I think at the end of the day, consumers will decide what is best for them. How's the rest of the business doing? I know you recently unveiled a new version of the thermostat. Talk to us about sales in general. Uh, we're doing very well. Uh, we continue to grow. Uh, you know, we've talked about uh, you know, our, our products are growing at a, you know, at, at a pace that uh, it's accelerating. Um, you know, we've, uh, this year, we'll ship more product than we shipped in the last two year combines. So that gives you, that gives you an opportunity that the growth is there. Um, the expansions, our footprint is, uh, is very important to us. And the doubling of our portfolio is a big deal as well. Um, there's been some speculation that Alphabet might consider selling off Nest to, to a third party. Is there any truth to that? No. Day one when I started, I made sure all of our employees knew that Nest is not for sale. Coming up, Udacity has partnered with Lyft to work on self-driving technology. We will hear from Udacity founder Sebastian Thrun about the deal and the future for autonomous cars next. And the competition for workplace messaging apps is heating up. Slack is looking to solidify its standing with a boost from SoftBank. We'll hear from CEO Stuart Butterfield. This is Bloomberg. Amazon is still on the hunt for a city that could be the home of its second headquarters. If New York City secures the bid, Brooklyn could be the big winner. The $5 billion corporate compound is expected to create 50,000 jobs over the next 15 or so years. A New York City real estate firm says Brooklyn's reputation as a hub for millennials could give it a leg up, though the borough has come up short so far in attracting big name companies. Eric Hippo, managing partner at Lara Hippo Ventures, gave us his outlook on Brooklyn's prospects. <laughs> Well, we would love it, obviously. 50,000 tech workers or quasi-tech workers in Brooklyn, that would be fantastic. I, I think the chances are pretty low. New York is a very expensive place to, uh, to set up a, a business. And, and w we're in the current administration, New York is not particularly business friendly. Mm -hmm. So I'm not even sure that New York is uh, bidding. Where is uh, business friendly under the current administration? <laughs> uh, well, no, I was talking about the local okay. administration, but, but you know, but I think that um, that that, uh, that New York should be looking for those kinds of opportunities because those are the kinds of jobs that are higher paying, that are you know information based, etc. That we need. In the, but I don't know that the city of New York is actually even acti actively looking at attracting. Amazon. So, what do you? I mean, what do you think Amazon should be looking for in a second headquarters? Since it can't it can't build out its headquarters in Seattle. They're at capacity. What should it be looking for elsewhere? I, I think it needs a, a, a city or a, a place where there is a, a lot of higher education, uh, a lot of pe young people that um, who are looking for the, the, the jobs of the new economy, um, and a business-friendly environment. We do have a soundbite from the mayor of Philadelphia. Obviously, a lot of cities competing for this now. Take a listen. We've gotten criticism you know, about the corporate tax breaks and that and like this is too big of a deal and it's too many jobs and it's too, too great of a company for us not to go after it and we would love to have it here. Uh, we, we have a lot of folks who, who could use the work and we have a lot of high, uh, IT startups and tech companies that have come into Philadelphia recently. So Philadelphia throwing their hat in the ring as well. How does the city benefit? Well, you, you, you do have to give them some tax breaks, mm -hmm. I imagine. But on the other hand, you, you're uh, providing 50,000 really good paying jobs that of people who will pay taxes themselves and who will uh, buy local products and, uh, and services. So, um, so it's, a, a, it's a definite plus uh, for a city. New York just opened uh, the Cornell Tech, and Bloomberg mm -hmm. is very much involved with that. So it would actually go really well with attracting the headquarters or the second headquarters of a big tech company. And I wonder if New York would do a good job of attracting younger talent. I mean, who doesn't want to move to New York, uh, right? Exactly. New York, New York, well, that's why I'm in New York. Mm -hmm. uh, most of my companies are here. It's a great place for startups. Uh, most, most people love to be in New York. There's a lot of diversity and a lot of things to do. 
Um, but the city needs to have a plan in place to be able to attract a company like Amazon. How would you describe the evolution of New York's tech scene? I mean, obviously, it's always been it's always played second fiddle to Silicon Valley to a certain extent, though, you know, many of the big tech companies have offices here as well. And the scene is changing. You know, how, how much closer is Silicon Alley to Silicon Valley these days? Well, today, Silicon, Silicon Alley or New York is the second largest center of technology in the United States, mm -hmm. one of the largest in the world. Um, what, what New York does what it's good at. New York is good at software development. New York is good at applications and services. We're not going to be reinventing the plumbing of the internet. Mm -hmm. We're not going to create the next generation of routers. Mm -hmm. However, we're starting to see robotics companies. We're starting to see, you know, all kinds of companies in all kinds of sectors because we have access in New York to the same technology that people in Silicon Valley have. Um, when's that $10 billion company going to be coming out of New York, that $10 billion tech company? Oh, hopefully it's in the pipeline. There's <laughs> a whole number of companies which, which have reached the billion dollar, at least in the private market valuation, that I think have the potential to be one of those companies. That was Eric Hippo, managing partner at Lehrer Hippo Ventures. Well, TechCrunch Disrupt 2017 kicked off this week in San Francisco, and one of the big name speakers was Sebastian Thrun, founder of the online learning platform Udacity. The company just announced its opening registration for a new Intro to Self-Driving Cars Nano Degree program. This alongside a new partnership with Lyft, which is funding 400 scholarships for the program. Thrun joined Bloomberg Television from the event and talked about it all. Self-driving car is the buzzword of 2017. Everybody talks about it, the government, and we all understand if they succeed, there will be more than a million, five, two million jobs on the line. We want to uh, help everybody to become an engineer in this space and be a contributor. So when we come to Gidacity, you can actually learn how to be a self-driving car engineer and, and join Silicon Valley and many other companies in building these amazing technologies. And in partnering with Lyft on these 400 full scholarships, are you explicitly aiming to target, say, women? Women and minorities, those who might not be your typical applicants? Yes, Udacity has a very strong social mission. We try to bring in minorities, we try to bring women, people of color. And also geographically, we have a very strong presence in the Middle East as our, as our corporate contribution to the Middle East to make sure that young people in the Middle East have a, a new perspective to life. But the core of all this is we really care about people to learn something interesting and participate. So many of us are left behind. Smart people are left behind. And the universities are not taking care of us. We really, at Udacity, we try to reach people of all ages, all geographies, all ethnicities, and all financial backgrounds. I want to ask you more broadly about what's going on in this self-driving car space because clearly there's a great deal of excitement but what we've seen from the likes of, of Google and Apple is that they've quite fundamentally recalibrated their plans. Why do you think that's happening? What is it about the industry that's forcing them in a sense to make these changes? I think it's, a, it's still a tough technical problem. We still don't have a car that would be what we call level 5 where you can just fall asleep and drive safely. But the race is on. In the last, I say, two years, the number of startup companies and even the number of big OEMs have joined the game has been staggering. If you look at the automotive industry today, I would say the self-driving car is the hottest topic that ever existed. So how do you know that you're creating a program for them, a, a training program for them, that's actually going to be right given the speed at which this technology is adapting and moving? And, and, and how much does it cost? And what job translation have you seen of those students that have taken your program? How many of you are actually getting jobs in the industry? So our program costs less than $2,500, which is nothing compared to college tuition. Udacity as a university builds its content directly with companies like Mercedes and Google and Tesla and many others. And those companies vouch for it. They are, so to speak, our accreditors. Uh, the original program, which was launched here last year, got over 40,000 applications. And even though not a single nano degree has been bestowed, over 60 people already found jobs in companies like Ford and Volvo and Google and many, many others. It's just a new way of, 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 of teaching. It's it's a new way of building a university. We strongly believe the companies that hire our graduates are the ones who should be responsible for the syllabus and help us making it perfect. Are you going to be signing up with the likes of Tesla, potentially Apple in the future to provide them with talent in order to, to facilitate the growth in this industry, do you think? Is that your plan? 
Yeah, and that's what we've been doing all along. So when you come to Udacity and learn, say, about deep learning, artificial intelligence, really hot topics, the people instructing you are from IBM, they're from AT&T, they're from Google, they're from Facebook, uh, leading companies in this space. We see ourselves as a platform that makes these leading industries give them a voice in education and reach people so that when students take those classes, they eventually have a really good chance of finding a job. I should say, we, we've been operating for many years now. We, we seen did a survey among our students, and roughly half of our students find a new job uh, half our credits within the first six months of graduation. Sebastian Thrun there speaking to Bloomberg from the TechCrunch Disrupt Conference in San Francisco. Meantime, Amazon is out with an update to one of its products. The company debuted a new version of its Fire HD 10 tablet that has a high def screen for watching video, up to 64 gigabytes of storage, a lower price, and a processor that runs 30% faster. The most significant new feature, though, is hands free voice control, which lets users do similar acts like the Echo Show speaker introduced earlier this year. It will be available next month. Coming up, Hulu's historic night at the Emmys. What the streaming service did that neither Amazon or Netflix have been able to achieve. That is next. And if you like Bloomberg News, check us out on the radio. You can listen on the Bloomberg Radio app, Bloomberg.com, and in the U.S. on Sirius XM. This is Bloomberg. Workplace messaging service Slack has secured $250 million in its latest round of funding. More than half of that coming from SoftBank's Vision Fund, putting the value of Slack at $5.1 billion. Earlier this month, Slack, which has more than 6 million daily users, announced its service will expand beyond the English language to German, French, Spanish, and Japanese. Slack CEO Stuart Butterfield spoke with Bloomberg Television about the company's valuation and potential for an IPO. We're still relatively early, although uh, we've grown fairly large. Uh, we're still growing as quickly as we can. And so we just had our first user conference in San Francisco last week. We announced a number of big partnerships. But significantly, we announced the launch of Slack in German, French, and Spanish. So that's why I'm here in London kicking off the European tour. Um, and with projects like that, we have very little ability to predict how fast we'll be growing. And I think predictability is one thing we'll be missing as a public market company. Stuart, I love that you have a year European tour. I expect t-shirts to be put out with the concert venues. You're from Vancouver, so maybe it will be like Hart from long ago and far mm -hmm. away. Here's the issue. Guys in dark suits and bow ties look at an extrapolation of VC fundraise to $5 billion plus and go, what kind of dumb accounting is this? How do you as a CEO <laughs> respond when the fancy guys in suits and ties tell you you're worth $5 billion? I don't buy it for a minute. Well, I love the question. So we're a little under four years in market. Um, we crossed $200 million in annual recurring revenue earlier. We're still growing at 100% a year, 50,000 plus customers around the world, 43% of the Fortune 100. Um, and up to this point, we have been English language only. Um, so I expect strong growth in Europe and also in Asia. I mean, within this is the ability to raise revenue. And you've got within your notes and your PR on your European tour that odd thing that you're actually building revenue. What's the quality of that revenue stream? Is it Amazon quality? Is it eBay quality? Or is it a pie in the sky? Uh, I'm, I'm not sure exactly how to, to take the comparison there. Uh, but one of the great things about SaaS businesses generally, and Slack in particular, is that that revenue is recurring. Uh, over the three and a half years, we've had about 15% cumulative churn. So it's about 20 basis points of churn a month. So. I'm not going to say that it's best in the industry, but it's got to be pretty close if it's mm. not the best. Um, and we are building on that in a pretty rapid pace. That was Slack CEO Stuart Butterfield. Well, it was a historic night at the Emmys as Hulu became the first streaming service to take home a win for outstanding drama. The Handmaid's Tale took home the top prize, something that Netflix and Amazon have yet to do at the Emmys. Netflix, though, still scooped 20 statues, a strong showing. Hulu won 10 Emmys in all, including Elizabeth Moss winning for Outstanding Actress in a Drama, The Handmaid's Tale. Back in July, I asked Hulu CEO Mike Hopkins about the show, and he sounded like he was looking into a crystal ball. You know, we started original programming at Hulu five years ago, um, and our most recent uh, batch started about a year and a half ago, and we've been in business with some of the best out there, J.J. Abrams, Jason Kadams, Amy Poehler, and, uh, but this one is really special. It really has broken through in a way that, no that, that nothing ever has for us, and so we're really excited about it. 
Bloomberg's Lucas Shaw joined us from L.A. to discuss streaming's big night. Surprise, really. I mean, if you had asked someone, anyone, a couple of years ago, which would be the first tech company, first streaming service to win a big award at the Emmys, they would have probably said Netflix, maybe Amazon. They've made a lot more shows, gotten a lot more attention. With Hulu, with, with Handmaid's Tale, this is really their first breakout. And I spoke with most of the Hulu executives at their party last night, and they thought that Elizabeth Moss was going to win for Best Actress. And some of them certainly hoped they would win Best Drama. Nobody saw them taking five different categories and really sweeping the, the drama. Field. Does the prestige here translate into viewership? That's a great question. I think it matters. It really matters in the industry. It's going to be a good lure for talent, for producers to say, hey, we can compete with the HBOs, Netflixes of the world, FX. You know, in terms of viewership, I'm sure they get a little bit of a marketing advantage. You know, Hulu just hired a new head of marketing from Google, and her job just got a whole lot easier. She can put on every single campaign, you know, Emmy-winning show. How much the Emmy means to the average viewer is less clear to me because it doesn't. It's not a show that has kind of has mattered in culture as much as, say, the Oscars or the Grammys. Last night, just about 11, 12 million people watched. Not as big an audience as for those award shows. Does it give Netflix and Amazon concern? Certainly a little bit. I mean, they have, you know, Netflix has been the leader in streaming TV. And they, for even though they will kind of downplay how much they care about winning awards, they spend a fortune trying to win those things because they know that there's so, it can help them in some inexplicable, excuse me, ineffable way. Um, and so I, I'm sure that they don't like that Hulu was, was there to beat them, that these big media companies that bash them in the press can say, hey, our streaming service won first. But in the grand scheme of things, as we kind of said in the intro to this, Netflix still won 20 awards. They won four last night. They had the second most nominations of any network. And so I think they probably also feel like it's a matter of time before they have that show that really breaks through. So Talk to us about how you expect the online content race to now shape up between Hulu and Amazon and Netflix and Apple. You know, this, this certainly makes it clear that it can be anyone's game. Yeah, look, all it takes is one hit. That's what anybody in the entertainment business will tell you. Uh, the question is how many chances you, ha you get at it. So Netflix is spending so much money and making so many shows that they have more chances to get that one hit than a lot of these other people. That being said, you know, FX, HBO, they've been a little more disciplined in how much they spend. And they would argue that they only make the highest, highest quality uh, as compared to kind of some of the garbage that Netflix throws out there. The question is, can an Apple or any of these other tech companies who are now entering the space, can they find that project? You know, Netflix early on had to take a lot of kind of the B or C scripts out there because people weren't sure you know, uh, what they were or what an original project on Netflix would look like. Now that Apple's coming around, there's so much competition. Are they going to be able to get their hands on the great material? Uh, okay. and, and that we don't know. That was Bloomberg's Lucas Shaw. And that does it for this edition of the Best of Bloomberg Technology. We will bring you all the latest in tech throughout the week. Tune in each day, 5 p.m. in New York, 2 p.m. in San Francisco. And remember, all episodes of Bloomberg Tech are live streaming on Twitter. Check us out at Bloomberg Tech TV weekdays. That is all for now. This is Bloomberg. Bloomberg.